name is Jeff Cornell. I'm president and owner of Source Selection Consulting. A fairly specific topic area in the title, and this is what we're about. I decided to be very niche. Um, I'm a former contracting officer, uh, policy, uh, acquisition policy writer, uh, acquisition training person, and uh, provide professional services to federal agencies and the government contracting companies that uh, do business with them. So I've got a experience as a customer, and I've got experience as a person writing the proposals and doing the pricing. So when an act came to me and said, hey, what's a good topic? I'm like, I'll tell you what the current topic is. Everybody's low bidding through the floor and winning the job. And that doesn't always make sense, because I was taught by the contract studies, yeah, you know, the standard for what's reasonable. The price they're offering even makes sense. But do circumstances that we're all facing, that are all government and customers are facing, uh, drive this, this sort of global acceptance? And then we have the LPTA uh, discussion, which we're going to talk a little bit about, and some other things that, that have recently been talked about how to do this. So does anybody watch the history channel? Anybody see why uh, 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 George Westinghouse and Tesla got the lights, the electric lights, the 1896 World's Fair? Why they got the job? Because they low bid it. And Thomas Edison, arguably the most famous inventor, in the country at the time. Everybody knew who he was when he worked with him. And J.P. Morgan, easily the richest person in America at the time, lost. How does that happen? Why? So I'm an acquisition guy, so I look at it. Westinghouse wanted to win the Niagara Falls job, which was real money. But it's exactly the situation. If you're a government in here, we'll study it. That's really what a lot of companies are looking for. They want that first vehicle. They want to get in. they got to get their job on the contract. And they're willing to do to be very competitive. So that's sort of framing what we're going to talk about today. We're very, very lucky to have an extremely uh, esteemed uh, panel. Uh, to my left is Alan Berman, former uh, Office of Federal Procurement Policy uh, Administrator and a member of the uh, Chairman of the Procurement Roundtable. He's a uh, PhD from George Washington University, a master's degree from Harvard. Um, next to this guy Torres. Guy is currently the director of information technology and contracting for U.S. Customs and Border uh, Protection. Uh, he's the, the director of IT, is responsible for managing the largest IT portfolio at the Department of Homeland Security. So you can imagine that's a very large responsibility from the administration and the policy and making sure people are doing uh, he leads the staff of 35 government contractor staff. This division is responsible for executing purchasing actions that account for more than 40% of CDP's annual appropriated budget. He's a level three contracting officer and PMT certified a Naval Academy, Academy graduate and Marine Corps officer. So you can believe he's a stand-up guy uh, and a graduate of the Harvard Kennedy School Senior Executive Fellows Program. And at the end is Jimmy Nulty. Jimmy Nulty's a 30-year contracting officer, uh, 25 years with the Federal Aviation Administration, has managed uh, a number of their largest, and if you know anything about the Federal Aviation Administration, they always buy big. So hundreds of millions of dollars, so a billion dollar type uh, procurements, source selection, uh, evaluation, cost of price evaluation. Uh, it's been Jim's job for 25 years, so he's going to give us a really good uh, perspective on the price issue. So uh, I'm going to give each one of my panel members uh, just a moment to give some opening remarks. So with that, I'm going to ask each one of my panel members to give uh, a brief opening statement. Great. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. I'm, I'm Al Berman. As Jeff said, I did the uh, procurement policy job in, in OMB for more years than I can count. Actually, I did it for about five, five years. I had uh, the chance to testify before Congress about 45 times. I used to call those opportunities to excel because a much friendlier audience, I suspect, than what I uh, would ordinarily find up on, up on the hill. But what I told Jeff I do is try to do a little bit of uh, stage setting in terms of the history of what's been going on, particularly with the, the comment Jeff mentioned about low price technically acceptable. And Rosemary Dowell is sitting over here who raised the, 
question with uh, my successor, Joe Jordan, on, on precisely that, that point. You know, when I, when I was procurement administrator, basically what people were looking at was low price. And uh, virtually everything was low price. And frankly, when we started going to the Hill talking about best value, the best value were dirty words. Really, I mean, people did not want to hear it, particularly the House Government Operations Committee, because they saw low price as being a, a real barrier uh, against uh, corruption. If you're going to go low price, then you're going to probably get the best, the best result without using a lot of discretion or judgment. What we've been seeing over the last 20 years or so is a, is a transformation, really, in how the government is doing really its business work reasonable, very reasonable price, it deals with both price, but it deals with quality, and it really does involve judgment and the ability of someone to make a, a decision as to how they want to go. Why did you get on that tap? Um, when, you, when you think about the late 80s, early 90s, the, the major thing going on in the economy was this huge explosion in IT services. All of these companies, big and small, you know, small companies, a lot of entrepreneurial development companies, they were interested in doing business with whom? The federal government, where they all had to do things the same way and go low price for the private sector, where you make bundles of money, the, the private sector. And so we had to try to figure out, is there some way to invite them in so you can get, take advantage of the, the quality, the innovation, the new ideas that they were going to bring. And when you think about that, you can see the, the beginnings of the transformation because then you start thinking about solutions, not technology. You're looking at services and you're looking at apples and oranges because they're not all going to do it the same way. The thing that makes them attractive is they have new ideas and better ideas and how to do the job. And so you saw the whole federal government move to this position of let's see if we can figure out a way to bring them in use a performance-based approach, don't tell them how to do the job, say this is the outcome you want, and then and then see if they can in fact get that job done, be able to, to measure it. And so that's really been where we've been for the last 20 years or so, in best value. So let's just kind of move up to today. And I'm, I'm President Jefferson Solutions, we do a lot of work with, with federal agencies who are one known small business. We've been doing work with Washington Headquarters Services, with, with VA across the country. One of the things that we're finding is a, a point that, that Joe Jordan made this morning as well. A lot of junior people, uh, people with less than four years experience in, in the job. But when you think about doing evaluations of apples and oranges and sophisticated technologies, that becomes a very complicated evaluation process. We speak to lots of general counsels, lots of lawyers and agencies. They very much worry about people making the wrong evaluations, not documenting the evaluations as well, <coughs> making, quote, conclusory. I'm not sure what a conclusory statement is, but that's what the lawyers say. It's conclusory statements, and it won't hold up if the GAO starts poking at you. And so I, I, I see one reason for going to the low price technically acceptable as being uh, saving money, maybe. But I do see another reason as this whole capacity, confidence, capability kind of an issue. But when you look at what low, low price technically acceptable is supposed to be, I mean, you're really looking at a case where this is going to apply to commodities, it's going to apply to the services that are out there in the marketplace, where basically everybody's doing the same thing. What we're finding now, though, and what I'm seeing in many different agencies, is applying this technique to very sophisticated procurements, multi-million dollar uh, procurements. And so the question that I guess I would raise for the group that I think would be good for us to discuss as we go on with the rest of the conversation this morning is, is, is this a good idea? Is this where we want to be? Or are we going back to a, it's good enough for government work, low price is really all and what happens to quality and innovation in that situation. So that's kind of setting the stage for how we got to be where we are now, and I guess we'll turn over to, to Guy.
guide us in the next step? Well, uh, you bring up a, a lot of good points I'd like to elaborate on um, from, from the DHS slash CDP perspective. You talked about what was price technically acceptable. You talked about um, quality. You talked about workforce skill set gaps. And those are things that contribute to decisions that are made um, at a higher level that have impact not only in the industry, but also in the procurement that is being put in play. A few things that I, I think we need to be clear on, and, and I want to focus on, on, on two areas. One is price technically acceptable. I like to talk about the acquisition workforce, or probably the program manager workforce. I want to talk about strategic sourcing, what that means in DHS, and how that impacts small businesses, and how you need to get skin in, and how you won't get the skin, and how you won't, how you know how you won't. So, one, one area, we talk about lowest price technically acceptable, and I agree with you on, from an IT perspective, uh, L Lowest price technically acceptable is appropriate for circumstances when you have standard commodities that are repeatable, that are easily defined. I don't see it being used regularly and will not be used regularly with the CDP for IT related services uh, because they are more complex requirements where we are of the opinion, and I've been, I've been very clear with my staff, that we need to, we need to go more of a best price, best value approach where non price factors, technical, past performance, past experience, and niche capabilities are overarching the price. And the price will does become paramount when you have competing requirements, or competing companies and offers who are still on a level playing field, then the price becomes more paramount and we'll make those decisions. But I haven't seen, I don't think we're clear in the audience that from the CDP perspective, and I'm seeing all the requirements on the CDI team, many of those requirements, I haven't seen a major IT procurement services. Anything is on your that's, I would say, anything that's $10 million, million, that's going to the lowest price technically acceptable. You'll see that on first source. You'll see that on first source too. You'll see in a lot of that many requirements for, say, custodial work, territorial work. In many cases, you will see it with an ID. If you are seeing it, you gotta let me know. Because uh, I, if that is an area we don't want to go to, because you know what? You get what you pay for. If you, can, if you you low balls and, and not the group exception, they get consequences to that in terms of time, schedule delays, and waste of time and effort on your part as well as ours. Um, you know, I'll bring to a good point, which I'm going to talk about this afternoon too, and really want to speak with the deputy CIO on uh, some of the challenges we have within, within DHS. Uh, Joe Jordan brought this up as well as Al. You need to, specifically the DHS, you need know, have 40% of the 11 and 2 workforce. Is eligible to retire from, from now and next five years. In addition to that, 40% of that two workforce has been one in five years of contract experience. Big gap. The big challenge we have in terms of, source, in terms of uh, understanding source selection evaluation is having the program owners understand what a good source selection is. What's a good evaluation? And more importantly, if you're here this afternoon, that source selection and CR responsibilities are considered prior to duty. And it's only considered a cloud of duty in those cases where you take it to second job, where it should be a very important job. We've seen so many requirements of the needs. Christian the right, we've seen a number of protests, and those protests aren't, you know, aren't because the industry just sort of submitting a stamp because they want to protest the need. Yet in many cases, I'll give you credit, there are, there are some glitches, there's some changes, there's, there's some concerns. We are seeing corrective actions on many determinants of the CDP because we are missing a few things here and there. Because in many cases we have uh, program managers as well as other folks who are lacking the wherewithal to really understand how the document objectively, objectively how this person, this company is ranked across another one. So those are challenges we continue to work on, but we're improving on. We're going to make improvements there. And one more thing I want to add before we pass on to our next guest here is strategic sourcing. In the past, you'll see, uh, I, I, some of you who are at Acquisition Excellence already talk about strategic sourcing. In the past, it was considered these, these strategic sourcing vehicles, tabs, people, long, you know, two, four source, uh, TACOM, IEIQ contracts, they were considered mandatory for consideration. So now they're considered, now they are mandatory for use in the sectors. So if you're not on one of those contracts, you don't have a team arrangement with one of those companies, you're already uh, some of the disadvantages. And it's so unfortunate that that's where we're seeing many, we're seeing the paradigm shift go there. And it goes back to the last few years. These companies have been screened, have been reviewed, they have, have gone into this competitive pool with their prices, and companies that not only have competitive prices, but they also have great past performance. So that's where we're seeing the pendulum shift. 
uh, in terms of requirements. But most important, I would say, commodity type work as well as program management, and the work, I mean, program management, finance management work, we need to support work. These are services that are really very important to us. Why? We talked about about the skill set gap. So that's going to be a continuing challenge that we're going to have to work on in terms of getting companies that are really good, who may not be on the strategic social vehicles, what type of labor can we get to make sure we get, we get the field. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm recently retired. statement I thought of this you know, story that I needed to share with you, the personal business nightmare that I had to live through as a contracting officer at the FAA. Um, one of the contracts that I inherited, and I wanted to preface this by stressing that I inherited the contract, <laughs> it was a, a, a mainframe IT services contract that, that was awarded to a large business, unnamed <laughs> and it was a little bit. They got it because they were the, the, the best price on the table. But unfortunately, they were also unbalanced price. So the way that the, their pricing was set up was it was all their, their prices cascaded and, and dropped each year from year one to end of the contract year five. So essentially, they got all their fee in the first three years. So after the third year of performance, Surprise, surprise, they recommended that we need to give you a price to come. Uh, we weren't excited to think about that, um, so we pushed back. Um, so they turned, essentially, they turned off the lights. They, uh, they, they scaled back our uh, mainframe jobs that were taken uh, overnight that we have found were taken uh, a full week. That included the other So, so low, low bid is. Not always a good idea. I think their essential strategy was to, uh, to reprice through change orders. Uh, of course, we've all heard that strategy. And it, that didn't happen. And my predecessor actually awarded the contract that was fairly tight on the statement of work. So there, there were no change orders, and they didn't get better that way, so they recommended that we reprice. The circumstances being what they were, we, can't give out a lot of agreement and let them off, put them out of the contract at the end of the year. So the, the lessons learned from that that I kind of want to show with the group were that at the FAA at least, we always stress during the evaluation process, we work very closely at cost realism as well as cost reasonableness. Um, and there's more than one way to approach that, depending on what you're buying. The other thing is uh, to play, pay close attention to the balance of pricing. Uh, too many solicitations prior to that point, they didn't really mention the fact that we could assess whether it was balanced pricing, et cetera. And another um, lesson was that uh, there's a lot more incentive fee contracts. Cost plus incentive fees, especially for the uh, larger major system kind of contracts, operate well, et cetera. So that was my biggest uh, story that I wanted to share with you before we talk about your budget. Great. Thank you. So I have acquisition training for <clears throat> government employees, and I would often ask them, so you have a $50 million job, you award $40 million, who's going to suffer? Usually, sometimes I get different answers, but usually it's, well, they got to deliver. They got the contract, it's written. They got the paper, it's signed. They have to deliver. So I say, who's the problem with it? It's there. The answer is it's our. It becomes our problem. Because when they don't, just like Jim said, they stop delivering, uh, if they submitted an un unreasonably low offer, and they're expecting to make it up on changes, expecting um, the largesse of the government, uh, oftentimes make those decisions. Well, we can't do without the services, or we've got to have it, or we've already got the contract. 
do you realize what that would mean to me if I had to recompete this? So let's just give them some more. So that's part of the dynamic that's happening here. Are there, how many industry people do we have? If you raise your hand for industry. How many government people? You guys are more important than the rest of us. <laughs> but, but that is part of the challenge. Once you've been through the source selection process, Part of why I started my business was I worked with a lot of program offices that didn't want to deal with it. They were like, hell, dealing with contracts is such a pain in the neck. I said, okay, I'll offer you translation services. I'll help you talk to them. That's why I started my company as a translation service. You go through this effort, you get scared to death by the CEO. You're going, don't do this, don't do that, don't talk to anybody. You're going to sit in this room, you're going to be locked in this room, you're going to read all these proposals, you've got to write down the transcripts. The transcripts not right. It's not and there's a protest, and there's probably going to be a protest, and hopefully they won't call you to testify and this is a question you want to examine. I'm not doing that. <laughs> we get to put ourselves sometimes in situations where we'll do almost anything to keep that vehicle built. And industry recognizes that. And recognizes in a highly competitive environment, you want to get a low price, usually we'll win. And it's what I call this complicity among the parties. Then there's one. Uh, extra low bid, they hope they can win against that. And the government, uh, through its evaluation, decides, yep, that's just low price. Through, I think a lot of it is also history. Low price, high technical, hey, how could you lose? One of my jobs as a consultant was doing cost and price analysis on large proposals. And I had that moment in the these, these source evaluation team where the source selection official said, low price, high tech, that's perfect. Yeah, I know, but you're paying me to tell you, give a risk assessment of that price, and you can say that price is very risky. And discussions around the room, and no, I can't, I can't miss. No one would dare protest high tech, low price, right? Okay, well, you're taking on some risk, but okay. Award the contract, it's bad to be cost reimbursable. First invoices come in. All the indirect rates have gone up 20%, and direct is indirect costs that they had proposed also were elevated uh, up to 20%. They were going to pay a lot more than what they had initially thought based on the, the pricing. And we had identified that. We had looked at it and said that. These prices don't look like they're consistent with what the market is and what these things that they're proposing cost. <coughs> so it's going to cost. But the point of this little segment is it's going to cost one way or the other. If you, if you think you're going to get something out of them, if you think the industry has uh, resources or capabilities that they're going to be willing to pay for themselves, very rare, very rare. Uh, whether you're dealing with a small business who just doesn't have it, or a very large business who you think they have tons of resources. I read the paper, how much money they, you know, how much profit they have. Right, but they're accountable every quarter to the margin, how much they're making. So that makes every single dollar <laughs> to those big companies that you think have a lot of money, makes it important every single dollar. They have people with the little rectangular sunglasses who stare at, usually in their 20s, sorry if that's the ages, they're staring at Excel spreadsheets and their job is to make sure you meet certain profitability margins for those companies. And that's what drives a lot of their programs. So you're not going to get over on And if you do, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you money or it's going to cost performance. So it's an important message that you do a careful evaluation. And you make a risk assessment of that price. That was one of the important uh, messages. The other is sort of what we talked about here in terms of acquisition workforce skills, blocking and tackling. Some of the basics. I coach my son's little flag football team. The first thing I teach them is how to hold the football. Seems like everybody should know, right? Well, there's certain ways to hold it that are better than others. You don't hang on to it. How to stand, even some of them how to run, the basics. When you're doing a, a, a new procurement, just start with the basics. What kind of thing are we buying? Is it a commercial product? Is it simple? Is it fixed price? Is there a market for it? Or is it something else? In most of our experiences, the federal government, 60% services, a lot of what we're buying is not just the simple, I know exactly, everybody knows what it is, there's a market for it, and there's a price for it, and the terms and conditions don't change much. Joe Jordan conditions. If it's other than that, then you need to think about what you're going to evaluate and how it's going to be priced. I had a customer who was paying for Snow removal services uh, by the hour in, in North Dakota. And she was getting, paying a lot. 
and they would send these small trucks with bad equipment. And, <coughs> and then one day she had an industry day, and they said, "Why do you do it by the hour? We do it by what's called push. It's one time, you know." Oh, that's great. That's how old. So learning more, and, and this leads into another uh, thing I wanted to bring up was the communication process, and it's been pushed by OFTP, uh, the myth busting. Uh, discussions is better communication between industry and government and finding out what things what things potentially could cost and not being afraid to ask industry what do you think something like that might cost because in government when you say what do you guys think that would cost industry's like ah I'm not signed up to it and you'll hold it to you'll hold me you'll hold me to that. Well no. Uh, communication helping us understand what our better our requirements as government industry helping to understand what it is you're trying to get at. Uh, the more of that communication that gives them, the better the service. So, I know we had, uh, I thought I had a guy taking questions. Are there any questions so far? One of my fellow trainer, I loved your question that you asked. And I was like, I, was like I, get, I, had, I had the same scenario. Three to six months or 20 years. I'm like, why do 20 year people in my class? Like, well, we got to recertify every so, Oh, yeah, so, oh, yeah. So. yeah. Okay. Well, price technically acceptable. I lived for the last time, you know, back in the 90s. And the issue was, and this is, this is not private side, this is service side. I had to cancel a lot of contracts because they weren't performing, the quality wasn't there. That's what we discussed earlier. No, the quality wasn't there. But the contractors with people didn't understand the quality of that. It was all home price. And as I said earlier, that's what we've got now. So now, competition, low price, big businesses, they can afford to cut their profit down to nothing and use that. So how does a small business, small business needs some type of profit, how can they, under this LPTA, you know, compete with the big businesses who can basically lose money on that? So I've, I've been through going from being an 8A where we were extremely successful to get kicked out of the nest and out to the world where you name the three letter companies that you had to compete against all of a sudden who had 10 times the resources we had to write their proposal. You could price it virtually any way they wanted because they had lots of other business other places to make up for it they wanted to win. So I'm in that circumstance now and it's very difficult. If you have to find things, mean, the, the government is doing what it can to set things aside as much as possible for competition among small businesses of various flavors, whatever you, you know, pay day, service day, letter, small business alone. Um, but it's it's difficult. If a big company wants to win something, you know, unless you've got a unique capability or, or some specific skill, it's tough because they can price it virtually anyway. And, and, and what, what exacerbates that is, is um, a lot of vehicle paths or strategic sourcing that's used where you're the second or third person on the pricing tier, which means, yeah, we'll maybe give you your, your work share, but you're not going to make it. Yeah. My, my, my thought is, and we, we've been in that game, we, we run a large um, agency, um, GRAC, not, not GRAC, uh, what do you call it? Um, Multiple IDIQ contracts um, with, uh, with USDA. And in uh, that particular, and we went up against all the big boys. We were the only small business. And we competed on many task orders. And you know, I've been in this industry my whole career, so I really know how to price. We have big businesses under prices by 20 to 40%. But as soon as they won the task order, they went back and the customer was called the barrel. They went back and got a modification to add money, and there's nothing we can do. We look like the squeaky wheel when we try to say, you know, low this and we say drug waste and abuse. This is illegal, and the small businesses are going to get away with it. The large businesses somehow find a way to get away with coming in and do a modification on the task order or put the contracting officer over the barrel by saying, okay, well, then we're going to go ahead and, and um, get rid of all the people and we're going to go ahead and, and fill them in with but, you know, half the price of people, and you're going to get what you get. And then the contracting officer says, oh, 
I want my mission people to be happy. You know, I'm just to serve the mission people. So they compromise and the big businesses make out. And it's like, it's very frustrating. We don't want to go down that path where we're highly ethical from. We believe in doing the right thing for the government and for the taxpayers. But it almost, it almost like creates the behavior within, you know, if you're a federal contract, you can play the same game. And it's not where we want to go. Sure, yeah. Thanks, that's it. That's
you know, I can, I can just, I can always with the, the CBP, FDHS, and what, we, what we're doing is helping <coughs> some of that is acquisition planning with our program offices, forecasting, you know, let, let, let's look at the spend plan, both the 10 active program offices within the Office of Information Technology, and I have three specific branches that are led by 15, and they're, and they're meeting with those program offices, and they're working with the appropriate budget offices, saying, okay, what does it look like? And it's even more, what's happening is becoming more frequent now because of uh, the budget situation right now. And we got a bit of a budget, but look, I mean, if you're recruiting CDP, as I've had an appropriation for the next 30 days. So we're looking at the next 30 days, and then all of a sudden, we have to look at what we can have for the next, in the end of fiscal year. And right now, at this point, we look, CDP is only obligated $500 million. We generally go over two, two, three billion dollars a year with this, within, within LIT work. So, that's happening regularly, and again, I think we're going to do this afternoon too, is um, looking at the scrutiny of, of the requirements, what's being, what, what used to be a check and balance, a pass-through, so to speak, with the program executives and program office, are not happening. Now they're looking at the requirements a little bit more, particularly the, the deputy CIO is looking at every major procurement, any major procurement or PR that's over a million bucks or has some significant mission or visibility to the commissioner, and say, oh, A or nay, and okay, how are we doing this? Go talk to the guy about this first before we want to move forward with it. Because and it goes back to, oh, really, are we getting, and it's not all about, you know, we're, we're staying away from the, the price technique. CBT, CBT's doing a great job. Awesome. Yeah. But I think the other thing that people are, are doing, and at least some of the people that I've talked to have been doing it, Generally, you see there's a 20 percent, more than a 20 percent split in terms of pricing, and you got to think something, something screwy is going on, and so you really need to go into another layer of uh, analysis to find out why should there be this kind of disparity. So, so there is definitely pressure, and it, and as as Guy said, it's really needed to be done at the front end of the effort in, in planning. Cir circumstances are changing for those of us have been in the for a while. The one is the secret in the general. The, the cost of what we do in D.C. and uh, the other big uh, government industry towns, I think is also going to change. Our normal, we talked about a wrap rate, uh, sometimes you need to educate your customers on, on what that is and how it works. That might be changing with healthcare changes. There are a lot of things changing at the same time. The smaller federal budget, the damage goes, and uh, every <coughs> And the cost of what services we provide may also be linked to retrenchment we haven't seen since the background you know, around here. So it's a time for um, new thinking about how we deliver the services and, and how we price them. This issue, I, I will, this issue of uh, the gap between the government cost estimate and, and price, though, I'm with the customer right now who's got that problem. They're not getting service. And when they look at their IGC and what was proposed, the story was already told for them five years ago. What was going to happen? In the, I don't know what couple apps, sorry, she had her hand up for I don't know what color that is. Me, I'll say And then we'll give them a little bit of a story. Um, the only mystery is more than I have a baby bar. I believe that staff in the company that your service is stable to that all over the country, either in base or on the client site. So we've had several integrators come to us and say, oh, we want you to be on our team. We don't want you to your services. They were best to offer these services. And I come back with, sure, we could do this. And we'd be happy to do this. But we've spent over nine years developing a secret sauce for how we find, how we improve, how we train. Yet they want us to come in at the same labor categories as everyone else. And um, this is my business partner, Bill Erico. Uh, he, he's been my coach here, and we still haven't figured out how do we win in this scenario. How do you have a niche product, a niche service, and still compete, but not have to come in with commodity-based pricing? So, competition, competition drives the lowest cost of offer. And the other thing they taught me in business school was, Companies exist to maximize profit for that company. 
Once you're in a teaming or a subcontracting relationship, only one of them can maximize their profit. A little formula you can keep in your head. Every time, as a small business, you go to talk to a large business, just remember, only one of you is going to maximize your profit. And it's probably not going to be you, unless you have something. I mean, your story is fantastic, and I think there needs to be, I mean, there is within the government, uh, an understanding of that. And, and there should be some consideration of that. I heard that you were asking, okay, let me see if I can respond to that. But you have a, a, a you feel you have a, a niche capability, or, okay? And so if you do, what you need is, if I'm in your, your situation, position, I want to look at the stakeholders, the agencies that may need your, your type of skill set. And, 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 and then and target those agencies that may need Need that. For example, if you, were doing, if you were doing training for agile development, I would want to talk to you. Because agile now is becoming a big deal with the CDP. Okay? You have folks who don't understand agile. They think they do, but they don't. Okay? And it's understanding what that mechanism is, how do you train your workforce to understand what agile, how do you work in an agile environment? And, you know, so you would, and that would be, that would be on, a, on the lowest price. Uh, yes, that would be more on okay, well, what if you do? Okay, how, how, how would, what are your kids are doing? Well, look at the price. Let's look at those non-price factors that you can to me that you're really good at what you do with the agile or your skills. Because that's something that's of interest to me. If what you do doesn't have an interest for where the CDP and my agency is going, there's not going to be a lot of desire to, to, to look back and say, okay, well, I don't want to talk to you. And I don't mean that in any way, it's just that's just the reality. That's a hard way to go. You have the unique capability, I believe, and it's, it's one that's very laudable, and there should be support for that. Big companies should find it in their heart somewhere to, to use that, but they also have their their pricing standards. If they don't match it, the, the gold standard for customers in, in government contracting is they double them personally. You know, you know, presenting your story to a decision maker. Going through other vendors, you allow them to take a lot of your funding. Yes, sir. Um, my question for you guys is um, going back to the same topic before, but I'm not sure if we got to the heart of the issues. We know that those situations exist. Not every program side has a procurement shop for things like you do. And so therefore, if they don't get it, then they get the mission not to succeed. We've heard stories. But as vendors who sit here, or even for government people who sit there and are frustrated by that, is there anything that can be done to help prevent that? Or is there recourse? What would you recommend concretely to do to help? Sure. Uh, as a, a contracting officer or FCO, what I would recommend you do is uh, try to focus and, and target those shops, those requirements where they publish draft solicitations. Where they get it. Where they get it. Well, exactly. You need to decide where you're going to spend your GDP costs. I mean, if you're taking a scattershot approach and you're doing you know, 40 proposals and you really only have a shot at playing, you're kind of, you're going to miss. But if you focus on where they're taking their time, which is draft solicitations, where they're going to allow for some discourse and conversation with prospective offerors, you're going to get a chance to come in and say, hey, I read your solicitation, your draft, and here's where I think you're missing it. You don't have the time to do that. I think they're going to save time somehow to skip the next step. I mean, you, you can always submit comments as soon as they publish the solicitation. <clears throat> See if they'll listen to you at that point. And if they're going to help you know, lowest price technically. At that, that, that stage, it's a little late. But if you can focus on the drafts and, and get a discourse with that, you're better off. Are you, are you, can I follow up on that? The requirements that they're pursuing in that scenario, are we looking at just from a small business perspective or are we looking at a large business where you're looking at the other side? Is that, because that takes a different panel on its own. If you're looking at just a small a, a requirement that you feel like you need to climb on, then, again, if I, 
we we kind of hear some things that they see we did again, uh, talking about communication, our advice. We down select too. Can we down select it? And you can try to get it. And we do have a lot of large companies on, on large complex requirements because, you know, that helps the industry you know look. This is where we think you are. We, viable or not viable. We didn't even know it was elected to, to, to continue moving forward, but we don't think you have the capability to do this based on what you, you receive back from you. Do that. And again, with a small business, if you're looking at requirements, I'm just getting strictly DHS and CDP. Again, many of the requirements are seen depending on, that, on the service line. You know, if you're maybe going, maybe it's a small uh, as, as a strategic source. You know, maybe you're going to get GSM small business. Depending on that line of business. And based on that line of business, I would position myself with where that, that's going in, how we talk to program manager. Not the CEO, you can get in touch with program manager. The program manager is the ones that are defining the requirement. They, and, and they're the ones that we probably we can reach them. I know it's a pain. I know that's part of the problem. We have legacy within, it's a chronic problem we have within the CDP of communication. We're trying to do our best. And I'm not going to get into why we don't continue to do a better job communicating. There's a number of reasons. But we all can be doing that. So um, you, you do get a hold of some of the program shop group is part of that team, that would be beneficial. And just, just to follow up on that, I mean, those are the folks who are going to understand technical risk and what the risk is and what the potential loss is in that situation. So I think that is your best bet in terms of getting somebody to realize that this may be a case that's going to happen for the, the agency to take. But if you're in the procurement process at that point, and most, most partner managers will refuse to talk to you. Can't talk to you. Correct. So that's why I said early on. Generally, the down selector will be prior to your PU. So you have, continually, if you have a program manager or a CEO who understands that, that the way it works, the way the binary is at, there's this communication that can happen. Once your RFP goes out, you know, you're not going to hear from yourself. We got it. Thanks. 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 We got uh, a couple of minutes. I want to answer a few more questions. Um, using that communication process, if there's a draft or a or something to make government smarter about what things really cost, I say there's a huge incumbent risk. You think, oh, incumbents always have the advantage. Not if they know how much something costs to do, <laughs> and everybody else is going to low bid it. Because they'll come in and go, yeah, that costs about $20 million to do that. We're doing it now. When they open it $12 million, they have to pay the price. Not really. Those people don't really know what they're asking for. So using that communication process to make the government smarter on what things really cost is a You would have your hand, I'm sorry. We'll do two more. You have your hand up for a long time. Okay, sorry. You have a lot of data on the
Thank you very much for being here this You have the councils. You're the most risk averse of anybody you're going to deal with. Any other discussion about the protest and what? So one takeaway. I know I got to cut it off. One takeaway is explain your price better than everybody else. If you're a small business, you're going to be competing in big guys. <laughs> Explain your price better. It's usually not that much of a task for in RFPs in terms of price. You give us your price, give us an Excel spreadsheet, show us how you built up. If you explain the logic better, you may have some things to put there. Well, I guess they have a better explanation for their number than this guy over here. So maybe if their risk assessment's done by the government, they have something to tie it. So that's your $250 an hour consultant. Not by charge. I would charge you. Jeff, yeah. if there's any questions after. Oh yeah, we're here to discuss, but I'm getting them. So thank you all for coming and making this a good discussion.